Um, hello, everyone. Um, welcome to the afternoon session of our first webinar on the educational outreach program on small diameter copper tube feed heat exchangers. Uh, we are already a couple of minutes into the hour. We're just waiting for uh, to see if there are more attendees coming in, but uh, I guess we'll go ahead and start this. So again, welcome. Uh, before we actually formally start, just a few announcements. One, uh, we will keep all the, the attendees uh, muted. So if you have any questions, comments, suggestions, uh, please type them in and then we will address them um, at the end of the, the presentation. Um, uh, in addition to that, uh, so the slides that we'll present today and uh, the actual uh, r recording of the presentation will be available to you as of tomorrow, uh, along with a feedback survey that we highly encourage you to fill them out. Um, uh, again, for those who are interested in, in getting a sample heat exchangers uh, for testing, uh, we require that you attend all three webinars and uh, fill out the feedback survey so again, I highly encourage you to, to do so. So everything will be available to you uh, tomorrow. So I'm going to uh, get started. Okay, so first introducing ourselves for those who are not familiar with us, OTS or Optimized Thermal Systems is a company that stemmed from the Center of Environmental Energy Engineering from the University of Maryland as a proprietary R&D outlet for uh, the, the sponsors. So though in nature our project and research are very similar, but we're two very separate um, uh, organizations, uh, but we also have exclusive license to the general purpose software developed at uh, UMD where we can customize in-house. Uh, our partner, uh, International Copper Association, uh, we have a, a strong partnership working on several projects, uh, focusing on heat exchanger design using small diameter tubes, and Copper Alliance is uh, a large organization that pushes copper for markets on uh, broad uh, applications, sustainable development initiatives, health, and the environment. Uh, so let me introduce myself. My name is Daniel Bosseler. Uh, I'm a PhD from, in mechanical engineering from the University of Maryland. I have recently joined OTS, and I have here with me my colleague, uh, Dennis Nasuda, who helped me put this uh, webinar together and giving me some technical assistance in the, in, during this presentation. So here's our contact info. Again, you will have access to this information uh, again tomorrow. So in this presentation, there are four main parts. One, the, the introduction, uh, then fundamentals, more um, fundamental approach in the small diameter tube heat exchangers, and actually small diameter tubes, and then we'll move to a heat exchanger design. And lastly, I will present some applications and some numbers for everyone to, to have a feel of, uh, of, of such application. In this background, uh, the first couple of slides here, uh, since the, uh, the program was intended or targeted for a broad audience uh, from students to uh, experts in the field, uh, so we're, we're trying to, to, to be able to um, address everyone. So in the, the initial slides, probably the majority of you are very familiar with it. It's very elementary, but I would like to, to keep it on record anyways. So let's start with the definition of a tube fin heat exchangers and the main parts. Uh, on the left-hand side, we have here a figure of a tube fin heat exchanger cut open where we can see the tubes. Uh, the fins or the extended surfaces where the air flows um, in between the tubes and the fins, and the refrigerant flows inside the tubes as indicated by the arrows here. On the right-hand side, we have a nomenclature. Uh, just for uh, record, for your information, I'm not going to spend time on this, but once you have your material in hand, you can always refer to this uh, regarding the parameters naming that we, that we use. Now, tube fin heat exchangers, we have two main parts. We have tubes and fins. So starting with tubes, in particular copper tubes, and why we, uh, we are interested in having copper tubes in our heat exchangers, some of the interesting uh, uh, properties and characteristics. We have high thermal conductivity, which gives us a low thermal resistance in the wall, uh, thus facilitating the heat transfer between inner and outer fluid. 
We have additional uh, advantages in terms of corrosion biofouling and antimicrobial properties, which uh, from a heat exchanger context is more to reduce the material buildup and potential fouling that can block the, the fluid flow and therefore uh, degrade the, the performance over time. In addition to that, copper tubes are a soft metal pliable, so they are e that there's ease of uh, inner grooving. Inner grooving, I mean those grooves uh, indicated by the, the, the image here on the upper right corner. Now, if you combine copper tubes with small diameters, we have some uh, further advantages. Small diameters, we will end up with thinner walls. Thinner walls means a lower, even lower thermal resistance because we're reducing the distance between inner and outer fluid. And uh, the second one, in particular for high pressure systems such as CO2, um, small diameter tubes with thinner walls can withstand those high pressures uh, using less material than conventional uh, diameter tube heat exchangers. Now, let's just briefly introduce fins and enhancements, and why do we have fins? So, uh, on the left-hand side, we have uh, here a, a two-bundle finless or bare tubes uh, with a subscript BT, and we have the air flowing uh, across the tubes, and the heat load can be calculated based on the overall heat transfer coefficient, the surface area, and the delta T. Now, if we look at the envelope or the, the space occupied by these tubes, when we add the fins, we have not only the tube surface area, but we also have the fin surface area. So the fins for, for the same volume, envelope volume, they provide us a significant amount of surface area, and therefore we get a much more compact surface. And by that, we, we have the, uh, the gain in, in terms of heat transfer uh, by adding the surface area as indicated by, by this equation. So the primary uh, reason why we have fins is to provide us with additional surface area. On the right bottom side, we have the most common external fins. We have flat, wavy, louver, and slits. And uh, on the left-hand side, we have into the most common tubes. We have smooth and inner grooved. So uh, we talked about fins providing area, but we can uh, improve even further the, the heat transfer by adding enhancements. And enhancements we can understand from the in-tube side by the microfins or the grooves. And uh, from the fins or the air side, we have these two types here, louvers and slits, where we can see these cuts. And what they do is basically increase the U. So the fins, they provide surface area and the enhancements, they provide higher U. And therefore, we increase even more the, the, heat, the heat load. Okay, so that was a very elementary and basic introduction to two fin heat exchangers. Let's start with the motivation and what drives uh, heat exchanger design and pursue for better heat exchangers. So we have a tripod of energy efficiency, environment and safety and cost. So we're obviously focusing on improving COP, uh, reducing billing costs and primary energy use, but in, on, on the same side, uh, on the other side of the hand, we have direct refrigerant emissions, uh, carbon footprints, end of life equipment and natural resources, and obviously, uh, cost, cost of manufacturing, tooling, and, and shipping. So when, this, uh, when we tie all these three together, we have a push for better and smaller heat exchangers. So we have this worldwide push for more efficient heat exchangers. And based on what we saw in the initial slides, uh, it seems like we have everything figured out. How can, how can we get more efficient heat exchangers? Let's add fins and enhance them and enhance the tubes internally. Uh, what happens nowadays is that we basically have reached the limit of the state of the art tube fin heat exchangers can do. So uh, the solution to push for more efficient heat exchangers is overall size in, in, in increase. So we're increasing the surface area while also increasing the volume, not necessarily increasing uh, the compactness of these heat exchangers. So over time, what we're seeing is uh, a gradually uh, uh, enlargement of these heat exchangers which obviously affect the shipping and space issues. They're more expensive, heavier, they consume more refrigerant charge, and they will obviously be oversized for many operating conditions, which can reduce the, the system's performance. So the purpose of this uh, educational outreach program was to provide and, and uh, the professionals in this area 
with new uh, design approaches for heat exchangers where we can actually have more efficient heat exchangers with more compact surfaces without having to increase the size of these heat exchangers. And we have significant benefits from, from it. And by doing so, we uh, actually, we, we can do so by reducing the tube diameter. So the four main objectives of this presentation is provide some of fundamentals on some small diameter tubes and how it impacts the performance, the, the uh, potential reduction in size of the heat exchanger and the, uh, the amount of charge uh, or refrigerant in the heat exchanger. Then we're going to move on to the actual heat exchanger design challenges, considerations. And third, I would like to discuss the importance of uh, accessible and inexpensive design tools for small diameter tube heat exchangers. And lastly, uh, present a few example cases where the three above, uh, above objectives were successfully applied. Uh, and though uh, this presentation is mainly theoretical and more uh, explanatory, the last session uh, I will show some very interesting numbers. So just for you to have a taste of this on how small diameter tubes can um, positively uh, impact the, the performance of these heat exchangers, we have 70% material cost reduction with more than 50% charge reduction and even reducing 60% of pressure drop. So these are... Uh, some, some numbers that we actually came, uh, we found by optimizing heat exchanger for actual real applications. So let's start with the fundamentals. And the first slide that I have here is the first order analysis. And it's called first order analysis because there is no uh, performance assessment uh, of any kind. It's just a, a geometry uh, analysis and the uh, impact of the tube diameter on three important metrics. So uh, we have on the y-axis the air side surface density or compactness, which is defined as the overall surface area divided by the volume or the space occupied by the heat exchanger or the surface. The second one uh, on the contour plot, we have a very similar metric called material utilization, which is the surface area divided by the material volume. So instead of the volume occupied by the heat exchanger is the amount of material that is uh, required to uh, uh, get us that amount of surface area. And the third one is the internal volume. The internal volume uh, indicates the amount of refrigerant that we, uh, we can get, uh, that we will have in, in, in the heat exchanger. And what we're seeing on the x-axis is the tube diameter, and the, the two curves here are for finless and fin tubes, uh, the purpose is not to compare one and the other, but how they change with respect to the three metrics uh, above described. So we can clearly see an increase in compactness as we reduce the tube diameter, and obviously we have a, a very steep uh, increase in the compactness as we go below one millimeter. But again, we also have a significant reduction in material required for the same surface area as we reduce the tube diameter. And lastly, indicated by the size of the, these symbols is the internal volume. So if we go from 10 millimeters all the way down to three millimeters, we have a significant reduction in uh, refrigerant charge. But why am I showing this? What do we know? This is what we know very well, and this is what we have uh, been doing for quite some time now. This is the state of the art tube fin heat exchangers with diameters above five millimeters. Now, we have a growing interest in actually designing these heat exchangers uh, with tube diameters below five millimeters, around two millimeters, as I'm indicating here. Uh, I have this additional uh, image here of a microchannel, which is the counterpart or uh, the competitor of a tube fin heat exchanger that though it's uh, situated somewhere here in this plot, it does have some um, uh, disadvantages that we'll discuss further on and why we should pursue the tube fin heat exchangers with smaller diameters. And the last region, what I'm calling the future generation of heat exchangers, and we're obviously going uh, over time towards that direction. But the future generation of heat exchangers, though it seems theoretically pretty good, uh, it's still very costly and very challenging in terms of manufacturing. So we don't have uh, technology readiness to manufacture uh, such heat exchangers. But we do have a technology readiness for manufacturing tube fin heat exchangers with small diameter tubes in the, in the group or the region that I'm indicating over here. And that's uh, uh, where the, the, the purpose of this uh, program is focused on. 
Now let's talk about the performance and starting with the airflow thermohydraulic characteristics as we change the tube diameter. So now I'm not talking about heat exchangers, but from a fundamental aspect of the tube diameter itself. If we look at the, uh, the relationship that the, between the non-dimensional numbers, especially Nussel and Reynolds numbers, if we derive the above equation, we, one will find out that uh, the heat transfer coefficient indicated by H is inversely proportional to the hydraulic diameter of the tube. So the relationship is hydraulic diameter to the power of m minus one, where m is usually a number between zero and one. And why does that happen? Uh, when we look at two different diameter tubes, and we have a flow across these tubes with the same velocity but different diameters, what happens is in the small diameter, the diameter tube, the absolute thickness of the thermal boundary layer is actually smaller than it is for the larger tube. And the implication to the uh, thinner uh, thermal boundary layer is a higher temperature gradient at the wall. And the heat transfer coefficient is directly proportional to the temperature gradient of the, of the wall because it indicates the thermal diffusion between the wall and the tube. Uh, sorry, the tube and the fluid. So we have a local heat transfer, higher local heat transfer coefficient across the tube surface with small diameter tubes, which gives us a, an, an average higher overall heat transfer coefficient. Another interesting aspect of this is that uh, since we have the same velocity, the Reynolds numbers on a small diameter tube is uh, smaller than the Reynolds number is also smaller. Therefore, the separation point occurs a little bit further uh, on the surface. So we have a relative uh, larger surface or effective heat transfer surface on a small diameter tube compared to the larger diameter. And why are we comparing same velocities? Because in the heat exchanger context, we usually have similar phase areas and similar flow rates. So the actual uh, air flow velocity ac across the tube bundle is very similar regardless the tube diameter. But even if one asks, you no, know, from a fundamental aspect, what happens if we compare them in a dynamically equivalent uh, flow condition or the same Reynolds numbers, then for the same Reynolds number, the smaller diameter tube would have a much higher velocity and the heat transfer coefficient is directly proportional to the velocity, therefore it increases even more. So what this is suggesting and showing is uh, the heat transfer coefficient is a primarily a function of the, hydraulics, uh, the hydraulic diameter of the surface and the flow regime will basically uh, dictate the intensity to which the heat transfer coefficient changes. Uh, and Though this looks very nice, and from a thermal perspective, uh, that's what we're getting uh, out of reducing the tube diameter, regardless of the, the, the airflow velocity. But there's no free lunch. Uh, there's also a similar uh, relationship between the friction factor and the hydraulic diameter. Uh, if we look at the same relationship, the friction factor increases as we reduce the, the tube diameter, and the reasons are very similar. If we have the same velocity, the momentum boundary layer is also thinner at the small diameter tube, giving us a higher velocity gradient at the wall. And we know that the friction factor is directly proportional to the velocity gradient at the wall, and therefore we have a higher friction factor. If we uh, increase the velocity, however, though the friction factor uh, reduces, but the pressure drop, the actual, the overall pressure drop actually increases since it's proportional to the velocity uh, to the power of two. Now, what this is showing is that though we've reduced the tube diameter and we have a higher friction factor, we do have uh, ways to manage uh, how to uh, potentially get lower pressure drops with higher heat transfer coefficients. So this is one of the, the challenges and considerations that we need to uh, employ in our heat exchanger design when using small diameter tubes. And then we need to find a sweet spot between uh, the thermohydraulic characteristics. Now, just to give some uh, numbers as examples for dry air uh, on a flow across a tube bundle, finless tube bundle, for constant velocity and constant pitch ratios, okay, um, the x-axis is the tube diameter, and the uh, left y-axis we have in blue the heat transfer coefficient, and the right y-axis we have in red the pressure drop, and in green the ratio between the two. So what we're seeing here is that by reducing the tube diameter, we have a significant increase in heat transfer coefficient, though we also have an increase in pressure drop 
But if you look at the ratio between the two, we're still benefiting from uh, a tube diameter reduction since the, the heat transfer coefficient increases faster than the pressure drop. Now, another example, an interesting example, because uh, in this case, we have a tube and fin, and uh, the behavior is a, is a bit different. So from a heat transfer coefficient perspective, it's behaving as we expect uh, from what we discussed in the previous slides, though the pressure drop doesn't have the same uh, kind of trend that we saw for, for, for the previous case. And what, what we're seeing here is actually a reduction in pressure drop, increase in reduction again. And uh, there are reasons for that. And this is one of the things that we can leverage uh, and play with when, when designing small tube fin heat exchangers. And to that matter, if we think about reducing the tube diameter, the relative fin surface area uh, contribution to overall heat exchanger actually reduces. So on this plot, what I'm showing here is the fin to tube surface ratio. So this is the ratio of the fin area over the tube surface area as we change the tube diameter. And we have a linear relationship as we change the fin density here. But in any case, by reducing the tube diameter, the contribution of the fin reduces. So this have obviously an impact on the pressure drop, maybe positive, because we saw that we can potentially even reduce the pressure drop even though we have a higher friction factor over this, the, the tube surface. On the other hand, we also have some uh, less contribution to the heat transfer since the, the fins are not, not contributing so much. But this is not uh, in the scope of discussion of this webinar. Uh, um, another thing to consider is as we reduce the tube diameter for um, constant pitch ratios, the airflow passage depth actually reduces as well. So this can uh, reduce uh, the flow resistance by just reducing the path to which the, the, the air has to flow. And this is all to say that the friction resistance, which is a surface characteristic, does not mean is not equivalent to pressure drop, which is a heat exchanger characteristic. So again, we can balance out the heat transfer coefficient and, uh, and the pressure drop and, 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 and get benefit on both. Now, moving on to the refrigerant side of this. Um, and if you look at the physics, they're obviously the same. We should expect actually the same kind of trend. If we reduce the tube diameter, the heat transfer coefficient is increased, uh, also is the friction factor. But in terms of reducing uh, channel flow, this has been studied for a while in microchannel heat exchangers, as we know, and it's been overwhelmingly proven that we actually get higher heat transfer coefficient and they're more compact heat exchangers. Now, because by reducing the, the, the flow channel, we, we have an increase in friction factor, uh, ways that microchannel uh, concepts, they, they, they address the pressure drop is by having multiple distribution tubes or headers where we reduce the mass flux on each channel and, and also reducing the overall refrigerant path length so we, we can reduce the pressure drop within the tubes. But there are some uh, disadvantages of doing so. We can have flow mount distribution or even additional header pressure drop. And these things are um, advantages of tube fin with serpentine circuits where they don't exist. On the other hand, the conventional tube fin heat exchangers, they have lar larger diameters and they reduce the, the uh, that they have reduced heat transfer coefficient, less compactness, and potentially the, the number of circuits may increase the mass flux and the overall refrigerant path length that may affect the pressure drop. So the idea here is that if we reduce the tube diameter, we may uh, get the benefits from both concepts altogether. Now let's look at some numbers. Uh, so here, this is an example for a two-phase R410A with a 2.7 megapascal saturation pressure. And we're only looking at the two-phase uh, heat transfer coefficient um, with different mass fluxes as we reduce the tube diameter. And similarly, we have here a pressure drop per unit length. Uh, this is just to illustrate uh, first as we reduce the tube diameter, we are definitely getting higher heat transfer coefficients, and we also have an impact on the pressure drop per unit length. Now, uh, if we go back to the two concepts that we discussed in the previous slide, we have the microchannels operating all the way to this end of the, the spectrum with higher heat transfer coefficients, but also with higher pressure drop per unit length that is addressed by uh, headers and, and, and um, 
multiple distribution. On the other hand, on the other end of the spectrum, we have large tube fin heat exchangers uh, over here. If we move uh, towards this direction, we are basically somewhere in between because neither this or this spectrum end of uh, neither end of spectrum actually is desired, and we can benefit uh, from both if we have a tube fin heat exchanger concept that operates somewhere in between the two. Now let's quickly talk about internally enhanced tubes and why, why the enhancements are good. Obviously we have the, the intuition of it, uh, but first from a fundamental uh, aspect, let's look at a smooth internal wall tube. We have the fluid flow and we have the thermal boundary layer. And what is interesting about this is that we see the thermal boundary layer developing here and why do we want, uh, why developing boundary layers are interesting? Because the actual uh, temperature gradient uh, at the wall, they're actually higher. So we have a local heat transfer coefficient that is much higher in a developing boundary layer than it is on a fully developed flow, where it achieves a constant value as indicated by this plot. So it is interesting to, to get a developing boundary layer to increase the heat transfer coefficient or even change the flow regime. And that's exactly what uh, the, the internal enhancements do. They may either develop, uh, disrupt, and, 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 and have the developing boundary layer, giving us an average higher heat transfer coefficient, and or induce the, the, the turbulence. And the turbulence, what it will do, it will promote a faster thermal transport from the wall to the, the core flow inside the tube. Now let's just look at, at a few numbers. Um, if we look at uh, enhancement, tube enhancements, uh, on this plot we have heat transfer enhancement factor on the y-axis. The x-axis we have a quality or vapor mass fraction. And each of these plots, they indicate the tube diameter, say three all the way to 9.5, and the mass fluxes, uh, which they're all the same, I think, except for, for this one. And similarly, we have uh, the pressure panel drop, uh, pressure drop penalty factor, excuse me, uh, uh, indicated here on the y-axis of the, the second plot, also against the quality for different tube diameters, in this case for the same mass fluxes. So what I want to illustrate here is that first, uh, from a heat, heat transfer coefficient perspective, the enhancement is reduced as we reduce the quality. Therefore, on a two-phase region, by increasing the, uh, the, the vapor fraction, we get more enhancement in the, the heat transfer. But also, um, as we reduce the tube diameter, the actual enhancement also reduces. So this is 9.5, and we go all the way down here to 3 millimeters. However, if we look at the numbers, we're still getting a pretty good enhancement, even with the smaller tubes. Here we have 1.5 all the way to 2.5 between 3 and 5 millimeters. So this is still pretty good enhancement overall. Uh, in terms of pressure drop, uh, what uh, this plot is suggesting is that the quality has mm, uh, probably no effect to the, the pressure drop itself. So it's basically flat uh, across the, the, the quality. But also, if we reduce the tube diameter, the pressure drop penalty factor also reduces. Uh, which goes hand in hand with the reduction of the heat transfer enhancement. In this case, the three millimeter barely had any pressure drop uh, penalty at all. Okay, so this was uh, the fundamental section. So um, let's let's just summarize. You know the advantages uh, that we learned from from the the fundamentals from the first order analysis perspective. The smaller tube diameters gives us more compact surfaces or more area per volume gives us less material consumption for the same area and a smaller internal volume, which can be uh, translated into less charge. The, for both the air side and the refrigerant side, the heat transfer coefficients, they increase significantly as we reduce the tube diameter uh, at both at the same velocities and Reynolds numbers. On the refrigerant side as well, the inner grooves, they have uh, the enhanced heat transfer regardless of tube diameter, so we can all benefit from it regardless uh, if it's three or nine millimeters. But now, some of the challenges and disadvantages. Uh, as I mentioned, as we saw, the, for both sides, we have a higher friction factor. So this posed some additional design changes so we can actually reduce the pressure drop on both working fluids. And the inner grooves enhancement, they reduce with the tube diameter. Though they, they're still beneficial, they're not as good as uh, they are for larger diameters. 
So these are some of the considerations. Now, what, how does these things translate into a heat exchanger design and some of the considerations that we need to, to have? Let's go back to the friction resistance that we mentioned before. And for the air side, how, uh, how can we approach it in order to reduce the pressure drop? So one way to do so is by changing the face area uh, or enlarging the face area to reduce velocity. Although this is typically undesirable because in terms of space occupation, the face area may, uh, may be more important than other geometrical aspects of the heat exchanger. But if that is a degree of freedom, this is one way to reduce the, the actual pressure drop by reducing the velocity and still get high heat transfer coefficients. Other ways to do uh, is finding uh, two pitches that increase the minimal free flow area or reduce the flow acceleration in, inside the, uh, the, the tube bundle that can increase the, the pressure drop as well. And we can play around with the fin density uh, to, or also to reduce the, the actual uh, surface that is going to pose additional resistance. On the refrigerant side, uh, one way to do so on a two fin heat exchangers is to um, have more circuits. So having more circuits, we have uh, re reduced mass fluxes and overall flow length, overall path of the refrigerant, or even having shorter tubes, if, that, if that's the case. Now, uh, on webinar number two, which I highly encourage you all to uh, register and attend, there are some manufacturing aspects that also need to be considered in terms of heat exchanger design, and they, they will actually go hand in hand with some of the design challenges from a performance perspective. Uh, and just one thing, uh, an example here, so fin colors. So the colors are basically the, the extra material that we get from, uh, from the fin that separate one fin and the other. If we have a smaller, a very small diameter tube, the actual fin collar is, is, uh, is, is not uh, long enough to actually get uh, a, a, a good distance between the fins. So there's a minimum fin density that you need to have, and that might be uh, an additional constraint when you're thinking about reducing pressure drop. And there are other things that with small diameter tubes might be uh, also challenging, like tube expansion, the fin dies, types, material and thickness, and obviously we will end up with uh, a larger number of tubes compared to conventional tube fin heat exchangers, which also mean a higher number, larger number of joints. So again, this is just to highlight a few things, a few aspects of manufacturing, but uh, please register for one or two. They will discuss in depth uh, the, the challenges of building those heat exchangers. Now, I also like to talk about the heat exchanger design and how do we design it? And uh, well, the, the idea of this is talking about correlations and their importance. So when we think about uh, uh, assessing the performance of heat exchangers, there are three, three ways, basically. The first one is experimental, where we have engineers and technicians putting the heat exchanger in a wind tunnel and running the, the experiments and uh, acquiring the data, reducing the data. Then we have numerical, for example, CFD, where you, you build a model of it, but, and you discretize, and you get your thermohydraulic performance out of your simulation. And lastly, we have an approximation or correlations, which are simple mathematical functions that correlate the thermohydraulic characteristics with the geometry of your heat exchangers and operating conditions. Now, if you look at that from a cost effectiveness point of view, if you look at the experimental, it's obviously the most accurate way of uh, assessing the, the performance of a heat exchanger, but it comes with a high engineering cost, a very high capital cost, though with a low computational cost, but uh, it's a very time consuming process. And uh, if we think of heat exchanger design, that's the, not the most effective way of doing it so. Numerical, CFD uh, solvers are now much more accurate than they used to be. So we can get uh, relatively high accuracy uh, with uh, less engineering cost than, than for experimental, but still with high capital cost and a very high computational cost. And the last one is uh, correlations, which depending on the source data, the quality of the source data and, uh, and the quality of the correlation, we can get medium to high accuracy at very low engineering cost in terms of implementing those correlations and designing the heat exchangers, very low capital cost once these correlations are available, and uh, virtually no computational cost. So ultimately, 
uh, correlations are the most effective way in assessing performance. When, when we are designing those new heat exchangers with small diameter tubes, we want uh, correlation, uh, available correlations so we can uh, predict performance. Now, if we look at the, uh, the available correlations in the literature, uh, these are some of the selected most relevant correlations for the air side for various tubes and fins, fin types. Uh, the, if you look at the applicability, none of them were actually developed for tube diameters uh, above six millimeters. And why is that important? Because correlations, as I said, are mere mathematical functions that correlate two sets of data, and we have absolutely no confidence that uh, extrapolating a correlation can give us a confidence uh, confident prediction uh, if we're uh, using a small diameter tube, for example, or if we extrapolate any of the design parameters to which the correlation was not developed for. So there was a need uh, for, for novel correlations that can, be, can address basically the, this new um, design uh, space. And recently, uh, the University of Maryland and OTS have uh, joined efforts and we have now uh, nine new correlations for various tubes and fins focusing on diameters below five millimeters. They are CFD-based correlations, so we use CFD to, uh, to uh, gather the source data, and then we have a correlation that can accurately predict the CFD simulations. And though they, they are not em empirical, they are a very inexpensive way uh, of predicting performance uh, so it gives us the, the, uh, the freedom of not having to rely on CFD or measurements to, to assess the performance of two fin heat exchangers and giving some more power in terms of design. Uh, refrigerant correlations. Uh, as I said before, small flow channels, they, they have been you know, uh, around for quite some time for microchannel heat exchangers. There have been uh, several correlations developed for or at more recently, we've seen some new developments for internally enhanced tube with small diameter tubes, as indicated here uh, in, in the table. And basically, with both sets of correlations, that gives us uh, enough tools to you know, create uh, and optimize uh, novel heat exchangers. Now, the importance of correlation validation, though we have the correlations, which gives us a, a, a very good guidance on well, which direction to go, we're still going to end up uh, having to uh, validate them once we have a, uh, a new design. And this is just an example of a correlation validation where we tested the heat exchanger with, for a Louverfin, uh, using the Louverfin correlation and a small diameter tube correlation. Uh, in terms of capacity, we got a pretty good agreement, plus minus 3%. The refrigerant side correlation for pressure drop predicting plus minus 20%, but what is interesting is to see that the air side pressure drop was within 10%. Uh, with, um, and though the correlation is CFD based, it was uh, pretty encouraging to see how, uh, how good the, the prediction was compared to the experimental results. So uh, one thing that I want to bring to, to this uh, program is also the importance of tuning the correlations and, and making our tools more accurate and more precise. So we obviously need always additional experimental data for correlation verification and validation. And this, is, this could be an opportunity for collaboration. So for those who are interested in, in having a heat exchanger, a sample of heat exchanger uh, to test in your facility, we can share the data, do cross validation with multiple sources this strengthens our, our correlations and, and, the, and the, the accuracy. We're going to have a large database with access from everyone involved, and this can lead to uh, several new pub publications potentially. Uh, like I said, we have these correlations, and these are the essential tools for, for performance uh, prediction. And there are several platforms or software that you, know, you can basically put these correlations and, and build your heat exchangers or design your new heat exchangers. Uh, we are obviously going to talk about the, the coil designer, which is developed by UMD and OTS. Um, this is just an introduction to it. Uh, please register for webinar three, where we're going to actually uh, give a demo on it, on its features and how to uh, design a heat exchanger with small diameter tubes and provide some examples of heat exchangers that we designed uh, using coil designer and they were validated uh, once we had a prototype and tested. So, this is a very powerful tool and uh, computationally inexpensive, so to say. 
So let's go to our uh, last um, section, which is the applications. And I said, uh, here we have three, uh, three case studies, and all of them obviously using our, our design tools or our new correlations and color designer uh, to optimize uh, performance and, and, and other aspects of the heat exchanger. So the first study is uh, surface optimization only, where we're maximizing heat transfer and minimizing, uh, sorry, maximizing heat transfer coefficient and minimizing pressure drop on uh, two pin heat exchangers with different diameters. And the second one is an actual application for a split condenser optimization where we use new correlations and color designer to optimize new, uh, this heat exchanger, focusing, targeting, minimizing the air side pressure drop, the raw material cost, and the refrigerant charge. And the last one is a study also on a window AC condenser where uh, we were focusing on improving the system's performance, reducing cost, and refrigerant charge. So uh, the first study, as I said, uh, it was uh, several optimizations targeting maximizing heat transfer coefficient and minimizing pressure drop for different diameters. So what we're seeing here on this plot are three Pareto fronts for different diameters, three, four, and five millimeters. And the table indicates a few points from, from these plots. The first one, uh, what I'm showing here, is a seven millimeter uh, surface. And as we can see, uh, from a heat transfer and pressure drop perspective, uh, as we reduce the tube diameter, we go all the way up. So we can, uh, this is another verification of how reducing the tube diameters gives us a, a significant improvement in, in surface performance. Uh, the table also shows the, the, the end points in the, in the Pareto front for the five millimeters. Uh, but most importantly, we have here the, these three points, one from each Pareto set with a similar pressure drop and what we are showing is that for similar pressure drop, we actually improve or increase the heat transfer coefficient as we reduce the tube diameter. So this is another verification, not only that the heat transfer coefficient increases, but not necessarily the pressure drop uh, has to increase as well, though we get higher friction factors. So this study was uh, published uh, last year, uh, the Purdue conference. Uh, it's available online. And I think we also made it available, I'm not sure. Uh, the second study is a split condenser optimization, as I said before, uh, targeting minimizing the air side pressure drop and the raw material cost. So we have actually two uh, sets of optimizations, and the other one is air side pressure drop and refrigerant charge. And these are all the Pareto fronts uh, uh, for each tube diameter size, right, from three all the way to 9.5. So the three is here, the 9.5 is over here. And what is interesting to see is uh, what is the potential improvement or, or, or the potential that we get out of this. Uh, from this study, what we're showing uh, is that from both optimizations, the maximum pressure drop reduction we got is around 60% if we compare 9.5 with a 3 millimeter or even a 4 millimeter, 5 millimeter. Um, B indicates the raw material cost. This is basically reducing 74% of the material uh, between this heat exchanger and this heat exchanger. And again, all of these uh, designs, they're delivering the same uh, heat capacity. So this is pretty interesting to see how much material, how much less material is required to do the same job. And lastly, we have the refrigerant charge. Uh, we, here we have a potential of up to 90% of refrigerant charge reduction within the heat exchanger. Now again, we need to remember that uh, this is a charge reduction inside the heat exchanger. It does not mean that you're reducing the, the overall charge of the system because we're not changing other components, including connection tubes, connection pipes, the compressor, or in this case, even the evaporator. But a significant reduction in charge in the condenser will obviously lead to a reduction in charge in the system. Now the last study is a window AC condenser as well, uh, focusing on COP improvement, material reduction, and charge reduction. And here we have on this table a baseline and three uh, novel designs using small diameter tubes with different uh, fins. And we can see a 20, from 20 to 50 percent reduction in material, uh, 10 to 50 percent reduction in refrigerant charge while still improving the overall system COP in up to six to seven percent. 
Now, the interesting thing about this study is that this particular heat exchanger, we, uh, we have experimental data for it, and it ended up uh, reducing the overall system charge in about 10%, while also increasing the COP in actually 4%, not the actual 6%, but still increasing the COP, and reducing the cost by approximately 40%. So this is a, a pretty uh, amazing uh, improvement just by uh, replacing the condenser with a small diameter tube design. So the take home messages include small diameters, they are more compact, they require less material, and they will uh, lead to less refrigerant charge. They will yield uh, much better heat transfer, heat transfer coefficient. Uh, though with higher friction factor. Copper tubes they have low thermal resistance. They can withstand high pressures with less material. Uh, they have some additional benefits that might not necessarily be uh, used in every design, such as corrosion, biofouling resistance, and uh, intergrooving the copper tubes is um, pretty much straightforward. Design tools. Uh, correlations are the most effective way of assessing performance as we saw before but there's still a need for experimental data for tuning and modifying these tools so we can have more accurate and precise tools that everyone can use and, and get even better designs. And just to summarize the, the improvements that we actually obtained uh, with novel heat exchangers, from a surface perspective, uh, three millimeters had 70% higher heat transfer coefficient than a five millimeters at the same pressure drop. A 60% pressure drop reduction in a condenser with 75% reduction in material and 90% in charge. And in the whole system analysis, when replacing the condenser, we also got 10% less charge in the system, 4% more COP, and 40% uh, cost reduction. So this concludes uh, this webinar. Uh, please uh, register for webinars uh, two and three. The second one is construction of small diameter copper tube feed heat exchangers. It will address the manufacturing aspect of this. And the webinar three is the effective design of small diameter tube feed heat exchangers uh, using our, our tool coil designer. Uh, and again, uh, this presentation will be made available to you tomorrow along with the recording uh, of the presentation and a feedback survey and that we highly encourage you to, uh, to, to fill out and, and, and send it back to us and again, for those who arrived in the middle, I mentioned in the beginning, uh, if you're interested in having a sample heat exchanger uh, uh, to your facility, uh, delivered to your facility, we require that you attend all three webinars and, 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 and fill out all the, the feedback survey forms. So I'd like to thank you so much for, for your attention, for your time. Here is our contact information. Uh, now we're going to uh, read some of the, the questions that you guys put on the, uh, you typed here on GoToMeeting, but you're more than welcome to send us uh, an email if you have further questions or comments or something that you want to discuss. Uh, sorry, I'm, I'm reading here the question. So uh, the first one, let me just repeat the question for uh, everybody to, to hear. So the first one is, can this be applied to air water heat exchanger as well? Well, absolutely. You know, in particular, uh, uh, because uh, this is, uh, this uh, uh, regardless of the working fluids. And if you have, um, if you have a, a, a water, you have in single phase, usually the, the thermal resistance of the air is even more important on the air side. And by reducing the tube diameter, you have significant benefits as well. So this application can, can be benefited in, uh, sorry, air to water and or air to refrigerant can benefit from reducing the tube diameters uh, as well. Um, so uh, we received another question uh, in, 
uh, indicating that you know, a lot of the studies we show here are focused on condensers, and, and that's true. Um, and you know, asking whether or not we've we've looked at evaporators um, in, in these types of studies. Um, so I can say that you know some of the refrigerant side correlations that Daniel highlighted are valid for evaporators for these small diameter tubes. So you know those those design tools do exist for you. Um, and then the air side correlations that we've shown um, would also be uh, you know relevant. Uh, but when, when we look at evaporators, we certainly have to consider the wet condition um, where the surface may be uh, covered in a film of, of liquid. Um, so the correlations that we've shown here, these new uh, CFD-based correlations are specifically developed for the dry condition. So the, we would expect that when we do uh, experiments of evaporators in the wet condition, we would see some variation there from the accumulation of, of condensation on the, the thin surfaces. Um, we've done a few experiments with uh, both five and four millimeter evaporators, um, and we've seen fairly good agreement with uh, the predictions that the correlations give, but there is some discrepancy um, in terms of the sensible and, and latent heat load that requires uh, some additional research. Uh, but nevertheless, I think uh, the correlations do, you know, are certainly valid for, for, for these, uh, these types of heat exchangers as well. Um, Uh, just this one. Well, um, uh, we have a few more minutes. If anybody has any questions, uh, please feel free to type in, or you can also uh, contact us uh, later on. Uh, these were the, the questions that we got so far. So there's one more question uh, regarding the the uh, window AC system that we uh, looked at, um, and and in this situation we were looking at a heat exchanger that uh, was a um, about a, a 7.5 millimeter tube, um, and reduced that down to a 5 millimeter tube. Um, the tubes are internally enhanced uh, copper tubes, and, and the fins that we replaced them with were slit fins. Um, uh, and we also explored louver fins. Uh, the result that was actually shown uh, with the, the savings that we presented, that was a louver fin 5 millimeter heat exchanger that was dropped in to replace that, that baseline 7.5 7 millimeter heat exchanger. So there's a, there's another question uh, about uh, the effects of, of increased refrigerant pressure drop on overall system performance, and I think it speaks to a concern when we look at these smaller diameter tubes that uh, when we integrate when we implement something like a five millimeter or smaller heat exchanger that we're going to have to you know, suffer with this consequence of increased refrigerant side pressure drop, um, and that can be problematic on overall system performance, and, and that's that's certainly uh, you know a valid concern. Um, we so um, and especially on the evaporator side, when we have excessive uh, pressure drop, that can be uh, a challenge. On the condenser side, uh, the concern is a little bit uh, less. Um, but in any case, I think what we've found so far in, in designing these heat exchangers has been that with proper design and circuiting, we can overcome these challenges and, and design heat exchangers that don't have uh, a refrigerant side pressure drop that is increased to the detriment of the uh, system performance. Um, so as far as what have we tested, um, we've we've developed a, c a couple of systems in house that have five millimeter heat exchangers, um, and in in all of those cases we haven't seen uh, 
uh, a major consequence in terms of COP reduction or capacity reduction due to the the refrigerant pressure drop, but that's mostly because we design these systems, you know, they have the number of circuits that's required to ensure that we don't have excessive pressure drop. Um, hopefully that's helpful. So uh, let me just add to that quickly. Um, <clears throat> So what we discussed before is uh, uh, basically highlighting that small diameter tubes they have higher friction factor and therefore we need to uh, uh, tackle the, the design approach so we don't have higher pressure drops and that, that was the whole point that we can actually uh, do things such as increasing the number of circuits or reducing the tube length so we don't have the actual uh, higher pressure drop even reducing the tube diameter. So it, it does not imply that by reducing the tube diameter, we will end up with higher pressure drop uh, on both fluids in, in our heat exchanger designs. So in, in our optimization uh, projects, what we do we, as we, we constrain the pressure drop uh, exactly not to exceed our baseline pressure drop on both uh, working fluids. So uh, there was one question about the, the details of the fin pattern that was used for the AC optimization. Um, I, I know that this was a commercially available fin pattern uh, that was chosen, but I think for confidentiality reasons, uh, I won't go into that. Uh, and furthermore, I don't think I re remember the exact uh, dimensions of this, but it was a standard size uh, um, uh, tube, tube pattern, tube stagger pattern for the louver fin, five millimeter. Um, and you, you, I imagine you're aware uh, on the market there aren't a whole lot of uh, patterns available, um, so that, that size range is, is fairly typical. Um, you see the next one? Are there any correlations that support the argument of increase in the heat transfer rate when using grooved corrugated tubes? Yeah, so when we're in the single phase region, I, I think there's a number of correlations that, that do characterize the heat transfer performance of, of liquid water or liquid you know, uh, fluids flowing in a enhanced grooved or corrugated tube. And um, there are you know, certainly uh, uh, conclusions that, that, uh, that, that the heat transfer is enhanced in those cases. Um, the cases that we showed in this presentation are all specifically looking at the two phase region. Um, just to kind of put a little more focus on uh, the HVAC industry where the two-phase heat transfer is, is dominant, but in, in water applications, um, there is, you know, also uh, in heat, enhanced heat transfer uh, due to that um, enhanced surface inside of the tubes. Um, the correlations, uh, I think, um, uh, I don't know that they were summarizing here. I think we only included two-phase heat transfer correlations, but within our software and within the literature, you can find a number of um, correlations for uh, single phase heat transfer inside a small diameter uh, internally enhanced tubes um, that would give you uh, be able to characterize the performance inside of them and, and it, it, they would illustrate that the, the heat transfer is, is typically higher in an uh, enhanced tube than a smooth tube. Okay, so that's that's all the, the questions we've received so far. Uh, I guess we can kind of put this up as a, a last last call for for any additional questions. And of course, uh, you can follow up with us by by email um, after the session's over if, with any other questions you might have. Um, just give it a few more minutes in case anyone has additional thoughts. Um, so uh, tomorrow, uh, the presentation, <clears throat> the recording, and uh, the feedback survey form will be available to you uh, probably around noon uh, Eastern Standard Time. <clears throat>
You're welcome. Well, uh, I guess we're uh, now 5.02, so we will uh, end our webinar session. Again, I encourage you, those attending, to uh, register for webinars uh, two and three that will happen uh, next month and, and uh, the following. And please, I encourage you to fill out uh, the feedback survey. And also, if you're interested in, in a sample heat exchanger, let us know and, and send us the, the survey forms. Thank you so much for your attention, for participating in this program. Uh, hope to see you soon.